Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for attending today. I know a lot of other uh, competing pressures uh, on the Hill and uh, hopefully we all caught, caught the speech, but, but thank you for turning your attention to this still very important region uh, that we're here to discuss today. I'm Fred Wary, a senior associate in the Middle East uh, program at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this panel on future trends in the Gulf. Uh, those of you that follow this region may recall that about two years ago, Carnegie uh, convened an all-day conference uh, titled Dynamic Gulf, um, Forces of Change in a, in, a, in a Shifting Region. And the premise of that conference was really that, you know, in the midst of all these dramatic transitions we were seeing elsewhere in the re region, Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Syria, this seemingly placid region, the Gulf, was in fact un undergoing dramatic changes beneath the surface. Uh, pressures from an increasingly youthful uh, population, uh, new forms of information exchange, aging rulers, uh, sectarianism. And so that panel really tried to, to capture those dynamics and argue for uh, sustainable reforms uh, moving forward. Um, I'm really pleased to, to welcome back some of the panelists that participated in that conference uh, to revisit some of those same themes. themes. And of course, the region today is, is no less uh, turbulent, perhaps even more so, with the rise of ISIS, the worsening civil war in Syria, the challenge from Iran. Um, but this region is, is also facing increasing challenges. Um, succession, obviously, youthful populations, many of the same themes, but also additional challenges. Um, and I think the, the, um, the focus of this panel is, is really to, to, to examine and, and mark the launch of a very important report um, from Chatham House that, that captures those themes. It's, it's entitled Future Trends in the Gulf. It's a really remarkable um, piece of research, both for its breadth. It touches on economic factors, demographics, politics, um, the Gulf's international relations but also especially in that it brings in Gulf voices. There's a number of, of Gulf scholars that participated in this study. Um, to save trees, we haven't printed the entire uh, version, but the executive summary is, is outside for you to, to look at. And I'm delighted to welcome two of the authors of that report to, to present their findings, and then also two uh, longtime friends and colleagues to comment um, on the report. Um, I think many of them are, are known to all of us. Uh, Jane Kinnamont is a longtime scholar of the Gulf and also Iraq. She's the deputy head and senior research fellow uh, at the Middle East program at Chatham House. She's joined by her, her colleague, Yamil de Dominicis. I think I got that somewhat uh, correct. The coordinator uh, for the Middle East program at uh, Chatham House, um, also a longtime scholar of the Gulf. And then commenting on the report uh, is, is Kristen Smith Dewan. She's a visiting scholar at the Institute for Middle East Studies uh, at George Washington University. Again, an expert on uh, the politics of the Gulf, especially Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. And then rounding out the discussion is both an active scholar and a participant in this region's politics. Matar Ibrahim Matar, a Bahraini activist, former member of, of parliament in Bahrain. And with that, uh, Jane, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Fred, and thanks to all of you for making the time to be here today. As Fred says, the starting point for our report is looking at the Gulf countries, which are often seen as bastions of stability in a rapidly changing Middle East, and highlighting the dynamics of change inside these countries, which will affect their interactions with the rest of the region and with their traditional Western allies in the coming years. It's a part of the world that has undergone stunning economic and demographic development in recent decades. And for the young people, the under 30s who make up the majority of the population today, their lives and the immediate world around them is radically changed from the world that their parents lived in and especially the world that their grandparents lived in. Some of the Gulf countries have had the world's highest rates of population growth. Qatar and UAE have by far the world's <coughs> highest rates of inward migration. And spending fueled by oil and gas resources has encouraged lavish and dramatic economic development, propelling these countries to a much higher profile than they've ever <coughs> previously enjoyed on the international stage. And this rapid economic and demographic growth has in many ways boosted living standards, certainly in terms of 
education, health outcomes, life expectancy and so forth, life in the Gulf has improved. But this rapid change has also generated various contests, including contests over the distribution of wealth, economic inequality, corruption, nepotism, issues like land ownership, and also the, the immigration and economic change and globalization have raised issues of culture, identity, and how to manage diversity. There's been a dramatic expansion of education for this younger generation in the Gulf, especially for women. One of the major drivers of social change is that across the Gulf, the majority of graduates from universities are female Gulf citizens, and they're tending to get the best degrees. But in many cases, the employment opportunities that they expect are still lacking, and this is going to be a, a major area to watch in the coming years. It's no exaggeration to say there's been a, a revolution in the availability of information compared with the previous generation. These are countries that traditionally have sought to uh, have a state monopoly, uh, particularly on the, the broadcast media, and the rise of satellite television, spearheaded in particular by Al Jazeera, and of the, the social media has dramatically altered the information landscape that young people in the region encounter, even if not always, the quality of information. We touch on social media in more depth in the report, but it is normalising not just a consumption of ideas and information from the rest of the world, but an expectation of participating in both local and global debates on a, a more equal footing. Contrary to the stereotypes of Gulf youth as apathetic, well-off people, we can see examining civil society and the academic landscape in the Gulf countries that there is a growing desire for, for more active citizenship, for a participation in national development. And sometimes that's not a political activism, but just a desire to have more of a say and more in a role, of a role in the world around them. But we have seen also growing political mobilisation, even during the time of plenty that the Gulf has experienced since the onset of the 2003 oil boom. We've seen in particular, and at most high profile, the protests in Bahrain, the less noticed but still important protests in Oman, where the government responded in some quite different ways. We've seen protests predating the Arab Spring in Kuwait. But it's also important to look slightly below the radar. It's very easy for those of us in the West accustomed to images of protesters on television to pay too much attention to street demonstrations, not always <coughs> manifestations of deep change, and less to changing discussions, expectations, and ideas. So in places like Saudi Arabia and UAE, where there's been far less protest mobilization, you have seen people reasserting the use of an, a very old tradition, petitioning the ruler for demands, and people using those petitions to mobilise politically and to call, not always using the phrase constitutional monarchy, but to call for more restrictions on the, the powers of rulers, often for a more independent judiciary, uh, stronger institutions, not always demands that get the headlines as much as saying down with the king, but very, very important changes in expectations. At times in the past, you've seen the Gulf monarchies respond to and accommodate changing demands of their citizens. They are countries that have been resilient uh, throughout the, the recent decades. And at times of crises, such as the withdrawal of the British Empire from the region, the liberation of Kuwait, or 9-11, you have seen moments where rulers have taken opportunities to liberalise, to empower parliaments, and so forth. But during the recent times of crises in the region, since the Arab Spring, the trend in the Gulf has rather been the opposite. The focus has been on spending more money, but generally on closing down political space and narrowing the boundaries of what is deemed to be politically acceptable discourse. The report argues these strategies are short-termist and that they're not sustainable in the years ahead, because one of the major drivers of change in the Gulf is the lack of sustainability 
of the current economic deal between citizens and the state. This varies hugely between the different Gulf countries. UAE and Qatar, with their tiny citizen populations and large sovereign wealth funds, face perhaps the least pressure. Bahrain and Oman, the most oil poor, have seen already the greatest uh, protests around the time of the Arab Spring and faced the most pressing fiscal crunch. Saudi Arabia, too, even if the oil price returns to $100 a barrel, will face great difficulty balancing its books. Governments are very much aware that they need to move their economies beyond oil. They all have extensive, <coughs> impressive strategic visions for moving their economies towards what most of them would aspire to, to call a knowledge economy, rolling back the role of the state, making the private sector the employer of choice. Any of you who visit the Gulf or do business there will be very familiar with these kinds of ideas. But one of the core recommendations of our reports is that these visions need to be matched by parallel public discussions about the political implications of the changing role of the state and what a new deal with citizens will mean in terms of politics, not just expectations over the provision of economic benefits and jobs. Currently, the lack of a political vision of this kind is making it virtually impossible for these governments to implement the economic policies that they would like to implement. And what we've seen since the unrest of 2011 around the region has been a reversion to short-termist policies, a focus on new fiscal spending, pay rises, the creation of new public sector jobs, etc. 150 billion of new public spending was announced across the Gulf in 2011 alone, or around 13% of GDP. And we've seen the new Saudi king cement his succession to the throne by offering new handouts and spending estimated to total around 32 billion, although the IMF estimates that their fiscal deficit will be at least 14% of GDP this year. So, we are also arguing that the Gulf countries have an important opportunity to engage with their own populations on the nature of political change in the future. Because most of their populations aren't seeking revolution, and that's probably all the more so as some of the Arab transitions have turned violent and turned sour. We're all too aware of the risks of radicalisation and extremism emanating from the Gulf countries, but it's important to emphasise that supporters of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State are in the minority. The Gulf countries have been tending in recent years to generalise about their oppositions and to place peaceful oppositionists in the same camp when it comes to repression and punishment as terrorists and violent groups. But they would be well served to isolate the violent rather than radicalising the middle. The crisis elsewhere, the crises elsewhere in the region do show some of the risks of radical change, but they also show the risks that come from having weak, weak institutions and repressing opposition so that you have no way to manage transitions if extreme pressures do come up. So we also recommend to Gulf governments that they decriminalise peaceful opposition activities from online criticisms of government policies to things that are deemed as insulting institutions of, of state, that they renew a focus on transparency and accountability in government as more and more scrutiny of their public spending is going to come, particularly if oil prices are lower, but also through the social media. They should strengthen some of their existing institutions, particularly judiciaries and parliaments, but fundamentally, institutional change could be only cosmetic if the deeper informal institutions that govern politics are not also reformed. And ultimately, that means thinking hard about the, the future role of the ruling families and preparing the younger generation of those families to expect somewhat less of a share in politics and in the economy in the years ahead a sensitive issue perhaps, but one that is going to determine how, how realistic and how meaningful reforms at the more, inter, more formal institutional level are. In terms of Western policies towards the Gulf countries, the report is certainly not arguing for Western countries to come to impose 
new political systems or Western values on the Gulf countries. Rather, it's arguing that there are significant internal pressures for change coming from inside those societies. Western governments need to do a better job at listening to the priorities that come from inside those societies, not just from their governments, but from a wider range of civil society groups. And when it comes to many issues from human rights to women's rights, remembering that the issues Westerners prioritise are not always the same ones that are priorities for local people. We also advocate rethinking economic engagement with the Gulf, that much of the current economic engagement with the Gulf is in terms of defence, sales, energy and finance. These are all sectors that create very few jobs for Gulf nationals and in terms of defence spending in particular are often viewed as wasting resources that could otherwise be spent on healthcare and education. More sustainable economic engagement requires helping the Gulf countries to develop the jobs and training that they need for their nationals. And we also look at security cooperation with the Gulf countries, arguing that it's a misconception to think that we should ignore internal issues simply because we know that Gulf countries are going to be ongoing important allies in counter-terrorism in the region. The relations between citizens and states in the Gulf countries will be a fundamental element of how secure and how stable those countries themselves are in the future. And rather than relegating those issues to be the purview of human rights officials only, they need to be seen really at the centre of security and defence work with partners in the Gulf countries. I'm going to turn now to my colleague Yamil, who will explore in some more depth this particular issue of citizen-state relations in the Gulf. And of course, we'll be happy to hear your comments and to answer any questions that you might have on the report. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Jane. Um, so, yeah, as Jane said, I'll, I'll focus briefly on, on this aspect of citizenship in the Gulf and um, how the relationship between citizens and states um, is being redefined. Um, I, I would like to say that um, I think one of the major drivers of change um, throughout the region since 2011 has been this desire by uh, citizens uh, throughout the Middle East um, to sort of redefine their role um, within their states, so from being uh, you know, subjects to, to really becoming active participa participating citizens. Um, and this has been true in the Gulf as well. Um, however, um, what we've seen as well since 2011 in the Gulf is that the uh, sort of space for uh, meaningful, constructive political dialogue has been sort of closing down. Uh, and one of the ways that that has, um, that has happened is, by, is through um, Gulf governments uh, revoking um, the citizenship of some of its, of some of its nationals. Um, and I would like to focus on this specific aspect because I think it is a very important one that poses very important questions, both in terms of human rights, but also in terms of how Gulf governments are dealing with uh, political dissent um, and you know, what that means in, term of, in terms of the, this you know, long-term uh, redefinition of citizen-state relations uh, in the Gulf. Um, so, as you may know, since 2011, several Gulf governments have revoked the citizenship uh, of numerous um, dissidents. Um, I think the latest example was in Bahrain in uh, just this, this past January, uh, where the Ministry of Interior issued a decree um, which withdrew the nationality of 72 Bahrainis, um, and as is often the case, the list included, uh, you know, a mix of, of names from, you know, radical uh, Islamist clerics to one of Bahrain's most prominent uh, bloggers, Ali Abdul Imam. Um, and in a way, that's, you know, that creates a, a sense sometimes when looking at, at it from the outside that um, Gulf governments are doing something in order to um, uh, counter the sort of the extremist threat. Uh, but really, you know, we forget often to see that, you know, some of the people targeted are also um, peaceful um, uh, dissidents. 
Um, and, you know, Bahrain is not the only example. This has happened in Kuwait in 2013 alone. 33 people have lost, have lost their citizenship in Kuwait, including uh, several high-profile uh, opposition figures. Um, this is something that has, has been introduced in Oman as well. Last year, the Omani government passed a law uh, that um, allowed the authorities to revoke citizenship based on broad uh, national interest, interest grounds. Um, and in discussions that we've had with um, analysts in the Gulf, there was this sort of sense, particularly last year, that in, a, in an environment where relations between uh, Gulf states um, has, you know, has, um, have, 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 um, have not been that good, um, the one uh, area where uh, there has been an in probably increased cooperation has been on internal uh, security matters. Um, and so, and this, uh, the revocation of citizenship was cited as one, one very important example of this. Um, now, this is not new, um, and I think it has happened in the Gulf a lot before. Uh, and in a way, it can be seen as the logical conclusion of the sort of um, transactional relationship between states and citizens, uh, as Jane explained before, that is based on you know, an economic bargain uh, whereby citizens uh, receive, uh, are expected to receive certain economic benefits and in return um, for uh, limited political rights. Um, however, I think that where, whilst it's not new, the timing uh, of these revocations is very important. Um, and the fact that they have been happening, uh, particularly uh, since 2011, means that Gulf governments have um, identified uh, you know, political dissent as, a, as an issue that they need to, they need to clamp down on. Um, and this has important implications, I think, because um, in a way, it consolidates the current relationship that exists between states and citizens in the Gulf at the time when a lot of people in the Gulf are trying to redefine that relationship. And so that has the potential to create um, a lot of tension. And again, in discussions that we've had with uh, analysts in the Gulf, and I should say that we've engaged with a lot of, sort of new generation analysts, so young people who are uh, journalists, uh, political analysts, uh, entrepreneurs. And one of the things that has come up quite a bit is that um, a long-term approach um, to political stability in the Gulf would seek to sort of begin to redefine the current relationship uh, between, uh, the, between status and citizens in a way that is sort of it bases it on uh, on citizen aspirations uh, that go beyond the material accumulation of wealth. And in this sense, the state's strength in the Gulf would no longer be just based on its ability to sort of give or take citizenship uh, as, as it pleases, but rather on its legitimacy in the eyes of, of all its citizens. Um, so I would just say in terms of the sort of international outlook, um, it is quite interesting that the United Kingdom has um, started revoking citizenships as well as a way of dealing with uh, potential terrorists. Um, and this, I think, is sort of something that the international community should really consider uh, because it potentially can create a legitimizing effect um, or elsewhere. And also, it diminishes uh, the, um, the sort of the influence or the credibility of Western states trying to, um, you know, criticize some of these um, some of these aspects, uh, such as citizenship revocation. Uh, yeah. Great. Okay, um, Kristen. Sure. Hi, everyone. So I want to start by thanking Fred Wary and the Carnegie Endowment for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, and it's a particular honor to be able to share in the introduction of this report by my colleagues at Chatham House, um, which I think is a mention, or maybe they haven't yet, is the fruit of really a three-year commitment to study in this region. And I think that's really amazing to see sort of the commitment and this um, really um, thorough product that has emerged from that. Um, 
And I really recommend that all of you uh, go beyond the executive summary and actually take a look at the report because it is really very rich. Um, as they mentioned, I kind of read one of the key recommendations coming out of the report, um, at least towards Western policymakers, is for them to start to view the Gulf beyond the lens of oil and security and to take seriously the opinions and demands of, of Gulf publics as well, uh, a more rapidly maturing publics, I should say. Um, and I think one of the more commendable aspects of the report is that they really do follow their own advice in this aspect. Um, I know the development of this report came about um, modeled on this new norm of, of public interaction, which is reflected in the real integration of, of local voices, particularly younger voices, not only in the workshops that contributed to the analysis that went into the report, but also in the report itself and a number of small kind of brief uh, writings and commentaries um, that really touched on a lot of diverse topics um, from fiscal sustainability, expatriates in the Gulf, labor market reform, new media and its impact, and even the emergence of young artists in the GCC. And I think this is just a wonderful illustration of not only demonstrating um, kind of the, the desire and the you know, ability of, of young people in the Gulf to contribute to the ongoing discussion about the, the changes that are happening in the Gulf and to interact, um, but also of, of the, the broadening kind of society and its willingness and, and so many different aspects of society that, can, that we can draw upon and interact with um, now um, in this really maturing Gulf. Um, at the same time, though, the, there's so many diverse and novel topics that um, it's kind of difficult for me to know where to interact and to come into with my comments. So I decided to really focus on this main theme of the report about um, the Gulf Society becoming much more assertive public and the need for a corresponding evolution of uh, their Western allies and interacting with them beyond state-state relations. Uh, and while I'm in total agreement um, with the spirit of this assessment and suggestion to, to broaden these contacts, um, I wanna focus in my comments on some of these political trends, perhaps short term, um, that uh, uh, my colleagues have discussed that Gulf governments that are doing that are gonna make this practice to actually approach the Gulf in this way um, more difficult. Um, and these are new tactics, as had already been mentioned, that have come about um, as the government response, uh, has responded to the emergence of really unprecedented demands that emerged um, in the days after the Arab Spring in 2011 and continued. Um, definitely through 2012, um, and also in response to the new security environment uh, that has emerged with the um, eruption of this new Islamic State and other transnational movements and challenges um, through weakening states across the region. Um, and if we look at these tactics, I mean, I think there's one thing I can draw upon that happened uh, just this week that's really illustrative of the tactics. Um, uh, this week, uh, the most prominent and vocal Kuwaiti opposition leader, um, Salama Barak, was sentenced to a two-year prison term, um, which stems from his uh, directly challenging the emir at a public rally that took place in 2012 um, that was protesting the unilateral change in the electric law, uh, electric <laughs> election law, electoral law by the emir uh, in Kuwait. And, it's worth noting, of course, that, that his arrest and now jailing uh, follows uh, very closely on the um, arrest and now prosecution of Sheikh Ali Salman um, in Bahrain, who has also been charged, or has been charged with um, promoting the overthrow of the regime in Bahrain. Um, and I think these two leaders are really symbolic because, I mean, not five years ago, both of them were firmly ensconced in their nation's parliaments. They're both parliamentarians, um, Sheikh Ali Salman leading the largest opposition group, uh, or the la largest group actually in Bahrain's parliament, and um, Salman Barak receiving the largest number of votes of any um, representative in, in Kuwait's parliament. Um, and today they're both in jail. Um, and there's no question that both of them have been outspoken in decrying corruption and what they see as growing autocracy in their countries, um, and very forceful in their demands for reform. But contrary to any accusations, um, neither of them called for the overthrow of the monarchies, um, and neither was worded to violence. Um, and I think, uh, in keeping with this, you know, kind of seeing that the, these leaders who once had a very public platform for pushing for reform within their societies, um, we can also see that the parliaments themselves um, are now much less representative than they were earlier um, due to the boycott of uh, oppositions both in uh, Bahrain um, and in Kuwait. 
um, due to the repression and due to their increasing demands for, for greater inclusion. Um, so what this means is that the institutional landscape and political landscape of uh, people that can be interacted with in, the, in these regions is, is more restricted, as they said, um, not only um, from the voices that you can hear, but actually people that are available to talk to um, and the represent representativeness or the full kind of scope of the political um, opinions that used to be in the parliament are no longer there. Um, I think it's important to note too that, that these new policies of, of cracking down on um, peaceful opposition, both you know, in some violent opposition, but also in this case, peaceful opposition, um, has been taken a step further to, uh, uh, through the creation of a, a new legal environment uh, by these states um, that has seen not only uh, Musalma Barak and uh, Sheikh Ali Salman tied up in the courts, but many of their supporters and fellow activists um, who have now been jailed or, or tied up in prosecution um, and really there's this pattern of, of a new prosecution strategy, strategy and creation of new legal frameworks. Um, we can see this through an amended terrorism law in Bahrain. We can see this through new terrorism legislation that was undertaken in Saudi Arabia and the UAE. And also the aggressive or much more aggressive enforcement of these majest laws um, and patrolling of media and social media in Kuwait and the attempted new media law there as well. Um, so the strategy, the tactics of the governments is almost like a strategy of exhaustion to keep political and rights activists either jailed or tied up in courts. Um, and I think it's been facilitated, I think as was mentioned as well, by the changing regional environment, which sees some of the Gulf publics as being rather exhausted with um, kind of ongoing protests or some might see them even as lawlessness. Um, and anxiety about the regional situation they find themselves in, uh, fear of encroaching chaos uh, with what's going on in Iraq and in Syria. Um, but this um, new sort of legal cover um, also can play a role in sort of deterring um, criticism coming from foreign governments um, or gives kind of a way of, of, of arguing that, that, you know, we are um, undertaking all of these things under the, uh, the laws of our, of our countries. Um, and that has also been furthered by governments um, in the criminalization in some cases, actual criminalization of citizens having an interaction with foreign contacts without prior permission by the government. Um, and in some cases as well, um, the refused entry of scholars and policy even policymakers <laughs> um, into, into the country. Um, so all of this means that there we see a narrowing uh, of the public sphere, um, a narrowing of the expression coming out of the, you know, once very lively institutional, uh, political institutions, and a more fraught environment for this sort of um, public interaction. Um, I think as well, it's, it's interesting to see, and I think Emil kind of uh, spoke on this a little bit, um, or Jane as well, that this similar dynamic is also taking place um, in foreign affairs. They mentioned the interest in citizens in playing a larger role in discussing um, their country's policies. But as Gulf governments have become much more assertive and engaging in foreign policy um, and in trying to basically reshape the regional environment to their interests, you have the same tactic of le legal enforcement that has been applied as well to any public commentary and criticism of foreign policy. Um, so that now um, the Kuwait <coughs> Emir himself <laughs> has announced um, a zero tolerance policy towards any sort of uh, criticism of fellow Gulf governments and allies. Um, and we've seen active prosecution of court cases coming up against a uh, former MP in Kuwait who had criticized um, uh, Kuwaiti policy towards Egypt. Um, another who had criticized um, uh, an official in the United Arab Emirates, another MP, um, and also activists uh, on social media uh, being hauled into court for their criticism or ridicule following the death of King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia. Um, and this as well is backed up by um, a legal new institutional framework. Um, in particular, we have the GCC security agreement, which has not been publicized, but which there have been sort of leaked copies among some people um, that um, uh, allows for the extradition of, of citizens, or at least allegedly allows for the extradition of citizens that are wanted by fellow Gulf states. Um, as well as we know, it's been announced the creation of a new GCC, um, GCC police force and more co coordination and tracking 
or denying the free travel of activists uh, between these countries, um, which is, I guess, right in line with what Yamil was talking about earlier. Um, so uh, I was going to mention as well uh, the topic that Yamil threw out there about the withdrawal of citizenship. Um, and I agree with him that it's, it's um, both highly effective um, because in some of these states, uh, the withdrawal of citizenship is, is extremely costly. <laughs> I mean, the value uh, associated with citizenship, economic value, is huge. Um, and a withdrawal of citizenship means not only the punishment of the individual, but the punishment of his progeny going into the future. So it's a very effective strategy. Um, but it's also, I think, highly symbolic that I think uh, Yamil really uh, hinted about. Um, and it's, in a way, a real expression of a reversal that has happened in Gulf states under the current trying times, um, where we had uh, previously attempts to kind of engage citizens more, which are represented by, by the par parliaments that I discussed earlier that had active you know, opposition members pushing for uh, reforms. Um, it's also indicative in Saudi Arabia and countries like that and national dialogues um, that we're attempting to be, play, take a more inclusive um, approach. And I think now sort of this withdrawal of citizenship is very much indicative of a more um, exclusionary policy that's taking hold um, under these trying times. And I, I think um, we might see one, one concern, I guess, um, looking towards policy is is how the sort of exclusion, I mean, kind of has the opposite effect. So more inclusive policies, right, allow for the engagement of a broad um, uh, shape of all of the citizens. But as you have kind of exclusion of particular citizens very much represented by this withdrawal of citizenship, um, I think we might see um, uh, a reemergence of the sort of transnational movements that we saw that were very evident um, in the 1980s that kind of went more into remission as, as the Gulf states were trying to make more of an effort to engage um, and to resolve some of these conflicts. And of course, that's very concerning in a time when we have people transnationally you know, heading to some of these uh, states which have you know, less control over their state territories, uh, whether we're talking about Iraq or Syria, the rise of militias, and of course, the rise of the Islamic State. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you for uh, having me today here, and uh, I would like to thank Carnegie for their commitment uh, toward the situation in the Gulf. Usually, if there is a major event about the Gulf, you will find it here in, in Carnegie. Uh, I would like to thank them, and a special thank for Fred uh, for, for, for this commitment. Um, also, I, I would like to thank uh, 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 Chatham House for their effort and for um, their recent product and uh, their focus about the potential in the Gulf and the inspirations of the youth in the Gulf toward a, a, a liberalization. Uh, and I mean uh, by a liberalization in the Gulf in terms of uh, democratization and, and, and freedoms. Um, it's really <clears throat> a topic that really you will find it having enough kind of focus uh, to explore the potential inside the Gulf. Um, um, uh, I remember a story for my brother. He, he is an uh, exilofacial surgeon. He did his uh, residency in Saudi Arabia. He went with the impression that he will go to a place where you will uh, rarely will find a sophisticated expert and uh, very kind of uh, sophisticated uh, skills and, and, and fields. But he was surprised when he went there and find that the Saudis th there are participating in conferences, international conferences held in Saudi Arabia. And you will see the Saudis are uh, uh, under focus because of their skills and because of their argument and because of their knowledge, which is something that rarely we will uh, we, we have the kind of focus. We rarely uh, explore the potential of, of uh, the people in the Gulf. Uh, the same if, if we follow, for example, the, the social media. I, I, I get surprised if I see the youth are following economists. So uh, uh, 
what the economists are saying about the Saudi, uh, Saudi economy uh, is not just followed by experts and by intellectuals. You will see the debate by the youth about very sophisticated issues. And the debate is, is very wide, which is something really very special. Even here in, in the United States, if I'll see, for example, accounts for experts and intellectuals, you will see the interactions with the expert coming from very elite group, but not from the, uh, the wider public, which is the case in Saudi Arabia, which is something really uh, inspiring. Uh, and um, I, I was in, in touch with one of the Saudi activists on uh, the social media. He focused on the trends on, on the social media and what the new users of Twitter accounts are following in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I was surprised with his finding because he told me that after they were studying the new accounts on, on, on Twitter, they found that most new users of, uh, of, of Twitter are following hashtags and topics related to human rights and democracy. And specifically, they are focusing to follow up the news of, of Hassan, which is a group of uh, human rights activists who are advocating for uh, a transition in Saudi Arabia, uh, a gradual transition toward a constitutional monarchy. So uh, there is a potential which does not usually have kind of a, a focus. Um, returning back, uh, let me, uh, talk with you about the situation on the ground and, 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 and the Gulf, and maybe I'll, I'll focus a little bit about Bahrain. Um, things are, are deteriorating in the region. Um, uh, as Christian spoke about the arrest of Sheikh Ali Salman, we will see also uh, threats against the human rights activists who, who are speaking openly, such as Nabi Rajab. Uh, just uh, two days ago, he was summoned and he went to police station uh, and he may face new charges. And he also have a case on the court and he, he already sentenced uh, for just tweeting uh, about uh, the torture in Bahrain. And this had been considered as insulting for the uh, interior ministry. And he is charged by, by this uh, 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 charges. And uh, if we'll go to the, to the situation on the ground, we'll find also the new cases of, of torture coming back. For certain period, the torture had been reduced in Bahrain. But nowadays, we find the new cases. Uh, of, of torture. Recently, one, one of the protesters, he, he was killed uh, under torture. His name is Hassan al-Sheikh. Uh, everybody was shocked with, with the images of his body after he, uh, after he, uh, after he died. And uh, this really raised the concerns about, about the torture. Also, there are uh, some prisoners, they were leaking uh, uh, videos from the prison. They were able to, to record the videos and leak them outside. And they were talking about, about the, the very uh, tough period they were facing to give confessions about uh, explosions uh, and so on. Uh, another major deterioration is banning the protest. Uh, after the arrest of Sheikh Ali Salman in Bahrain, there is the government does not uh, provide any uh, uh, they don't accept any request for marching in bahrain before his arrest you'll see the opposition are protesting in, in tens of thousands on on monthly basis uh, nowadays you, uh, such kind of activities are banned and you'll see uh, people are protesting uh, inside the villages and, and, uh, and scattered kind of a protest around, around the country. Um, of course, this situation is not sustainable. Uh, the government having this idea that even Bahrain is a small country, it can divide it to two countries. They are trying to divide a country for a region 
which will have the protests going on on daily basis, and you will see the clouds of tear gas around those villages for, uh, for, for, uh, for those who are protesting. And you will see the business as usual in the commercial areas and in other places. Uh, this equation is not sustainable, uh, simply because the government are having a really a serious problem with the economy and with the debt. Part of the major strategy to deal with the debt had been presented by the Crown Prince in his strategy 2030. In this strategy, he was relying on bringing investment to Bahrain. All indicators are saying that investors are leaving the country. So even if you are able to have a commercial areas that running as usual, the business are leaving the country. And you cannot create job opportunities without having a, a, a really a, a settlement and a resolution for this conflict in Bahrain. Um, let me talk about how to move forward in, in the region, in the Gulf. Um, we have three scenarios. The first scenario is just to go without a change, as the situation currently is, where the Saudis are not moving toward uh, any kind of change. The Bahrainis are also, and the same for Saudis and, 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 and Emiratis in general. Uh, this situation, as I said, it will not be sustainable. And delaying the, 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 the change in Bahrain will make it much more complicated, and the price will be high, and uh, uh, all sides will lose. US government will lose. Uh, if this kind of a transition had been delayed. And the same for monarchs, and of course the same for the victims, who are the people here in, in this region. This is the first scenario. The sen second scenario is to see the change in Saudi Arabia. And after the change in Saudi Arabia, this change can propagate to other countries in the region. The, th the third scenario that I'm advocating for is to have the change in a small country like Bahrain that can bring a model, and this model can bring solutions for the problems that Jane was uh, exploring and, and, and talking about in her paper. Saudis are not facing debt currently, but Bahrain are. Uh, the, the debt in Bahrain uh, is considered to be unsustainable by 2017. After just two years, it is unsustainable debt. So Bahrain need to act now, while Saudis may can delay their acts in the, in the future. Uh, Bahrain can bring a model for this change because when, when the opposition were participating in the parliament, they were able to advocate for solution for this deep problem in our economy. Bahrain was one of the countries who were having the debate about redirecting the subsidies. Saudis cannot think in this policy at this time. After the uprising in Bahrain, what Saudis did, they doubled the salaries for their citizenship. They cannot touch issues related to economic reform. All what they can do is just provide the people more. And this is unsustainable policy. Uh, the solution can start in Bahrain because they, they need to act now. And there are the powers, such as the pro-democracy movement in Bahrain, al wifaq and other political parties, who are really realizing these challenges and would like to have a painful policies that secure the future of the country. So uh, al wifaq and the others were supporting the idea of redirecting the subsidies. <coughs> also, the opposition in Bahrain was the first group in the Gulf who was uh, accepting and supporting the idea of introducing the taxations in the Gulf. Bahrain have 1% uh, taxations 
uh, that goes to a fund for the unemployed. This idea had been supported by, by, by the Gulf, and without this idea of redirecting the subsidies and uh, introducing the taxations to the Gulf, difficult to find a solution. Saudis cannot do it. Nobody in the other Gulf can do it. The Bahraini government cannot do it. But if there are forces in power that the people can trust, these policies can start it. And you can find a model that can uh, bring a kind of a, a light to the region to move forward. And thank you. Great. Well, thank you all for that very comprehensive um, <clears throat> overview of both the findings of the report and then also uh, on the ground uh, developments as well. We're going to turn it over to questions now. Um, we'll take three at a time. Uh, please identify yourself when you ask a question and please do ask a question. Uh, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael Lee from the German Marshall Fund here in Washington. I wanted to come back to um, a comment of Christine's, which was um, the fear of encroaching chaos from the situation in uh, Syria and um, Iraq. And my question is, what response that is provoking on the side of the governments, particularly as citizens or, or of Gulf countries, at least in a private capacity, if not in official capacity, are thought to be amongst those financing some of the more extreme groups and uh, considering that in the end such destabilization could be seen as a threat in the Gulf itself. So how are the governments responding? Is there any effort to clamp down on the financing of such groups by citizens of Gulf states? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, Ryan. Hi, I'm uh, Ryan Silo, independent consultant. When I was uh, in Bahrain a couple years ago, I uh, spent a lot of time with the transnational workers, the uh, expats. Um, and I think that, uh, and we mentioned citizenship a little bit, but we didn't talk about what role they might have in the, uh, in the future kind of political changes or realizations in the Gulf countries. I know the situation in Bahrain is similar, but not the same as the other Gulf countries. So I think that'd be an interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Ali Liami from the Center for Democracy and Human Rights here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Motor the Saudis have been looking for an opportunity to annex Bahrain for at least 60 years, and now they have their chance. Uh, Jane, you mentioned that the Gulf states are going to be allies in fighting terrorism, allies of the West. In fact, King, Fa King Salman just last week awarded King Faisal a prestigious award to Zakir Naik, one of the most anti-democratic, anti-human rights, anti-human rights a preacher in the world. Yet King Salman gave him King Faisal a prize with $200,000 attached to it for has surfaced to Islam. How do you reconcile fighting terrorism with rewarding people who promote terrorism? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've got the question on uh, Gulf financing. Do you want to take the first? And, yeah. I think the rise of the Islamic State and its takeover of Mosul was a real wake-up call for the Gulf countries. So I think there were some in those countries who did see jihadi groups as potentially having some strategic benefits in, in fighting Assad, countering Iran, potentially encountering Maliki. Um, and then it's become abundantly clear that there really is a serious risk of blowback. Once again, let's not forget, of course, the Gulf countries have been here before as well with Al-Qaeda. The interior minister of Saudi Arabia himself narrowly escaped an Al-Qaeda assassination attempt six years ago. So there certainly are important people in government who, who realize the threat that this poses to their own countries. It's also important to them that they, 
that the West sees them as counter-terrorism allies. If you think back to the period after 9-11, that was one of the toughest times for US-Saudi relations, and there was a lot of debate here in Washington about whether the country was actually fueling extremist ideologies through rewarding preachers of the, the kind that you discuss. That was a real test for relations. The relations pulled through it, but I think it remains of, of critical importance to Saudi Arabia in particular that the West sees them as very much on side. Um, and I think for the Gulf countries, those sorts of concerns that might get raised by Western governments are, are, are seen as being much more important than the human rights concerns that are raised by Western governments, but often dismissed as just being a kind of, of routine thing. Um, the, the debate is quite fractious now over where the responsibility lies for fueling extremist ideology. And quite often when one speaks with Saudis or indeed with people from Turkey, there's a, a response that fighters are coming now from Europe, from Belgium, from you know Indonesia, China, and therefore this isn't our problem. Uh, but clearly there does need to be some introspection. Uh, the Saudi state sanctioned brand of Islam isn't a revolutionary form of Islam. You know, the ideology of Islamic State does deviate from it, but there are questions that need to be asked about intolerance and takfirism and sectarianism uh, that can sometimes appear to have an official stamp of approval. Um, on the migrant workers, uh, we focus more in our report on the Gulf nationals than on the important issue of the migrant workers but of course the the kind of the third dimension of relations between citizen and the state citizen and the state and and the other um the and there's a lot of conflicts and debates within the gulf countries over whether you continue to pursue an, a model of economic growth which is predicated on cheap foreign labor or whether you're pursuing a model of growth that is more about employing nationals and trying to change the the population mix uh, I think the very high numbers of migrants in, in UAE and Qatar means that the political debate about democracy is uh, unique in those countries, uh, in that citizens themselves are such a small mi minority that they have very little interest in some kind of majority rule. Uh, and yeah, the migrants play a very important role in helping the countries to define national identity, helping citizens to feel that the governments protect their privilege and so on. And we do have uh, a couple of the uh, writers from the Gulf that have contributed to the report have focused on that issue in more depth. Anyone else? Or yeah. um, sure. I mean, I think it's kind of hard at this early stage to draw a lot of conclusions about the interaction between Gulf states and the Islamic state. I mean, it's still evolving and a lot of it is sort of murky and hard to read. Um, I think if we look at some of the more prominent um, Gulfies who have gone over um, to the Islamic State, uh, they tell kind of interesting stories, though. I mean, one of the most prominent ones um, is a gentleman named Turkey Al Bin Ali, who actually came, um, he or his family came from within uh, the Bahraini Interior Ministry, right? Interior Ministry, I believe. Um, and is now one of the leading uh, religious ideologues for the Islamic State. Um, and I think this speaks to kind of the empowering that we saw in the last four years of a, a really strong kind of sectarian rhetoric that came about, um, and sectarian policies that came about due to the fears um, of Saudi Arabia and other states such as Bahrain um, about sort of how the opening, the public opening would affect them both in terms of, of pressure for, for reform and even maybe, a, you know, real pressure to, to change the governments and also of, of Iran, of course, and how Iran might be able to take advantage of that situation. And they promoted then kind of an environment um, where this sort of thinking, sectarian thinking was allowed to thrive even within government institutions. And I think that's one thing to be concerned about now as we see the rise of Islamic State, which draws very much on the same kind of sectarian ideology. Um, the second person just recently who's emerged um, uh, is uh, this guy they're calling Jihadi Joe Amwazi, I believe, um, who does have this story of, of coming from the UK and probably most likely a lot of his, uh, you know, radicalization occurred there. 
but his origins were actually in Kuwait, where he was a Kuwaiti Badoon, which again speaks to this issue of unresolved uh, citizens. These are people who were never given full citizenship within the country and have this kind of um, uh, tenuous existence uh, being in the state but not part of the state. Um, and again, that kind of speaks to what I was talking about the few years about the rising of kind of transnationalism when you have all of these citizens that are dissatisfied and have a lot of Islamic movements and other groups that they can come into, both whether it be Shia coming from Shia militias and, and other sorts of movements or Sunnis from the Islamic State and other sorts of appeals. Great. I'm actually going to insert myself here. I've got a question. Um, Jane, on the last page, I mean, you argue, I think, quite sensibly for, you know, reshaping uh, security cooperation in the Gulf and, and this new discourse about a more inclusive and sustainable security. Um, if we were to go after this panel over to the Pentagon and, and you were to introduce this, this finding to them, how would, you, how would you start that conversation and what specific recommendations would you make? Because my sense is in, in, you know, that over there at DOD in their heart of hearts, they get this. I mean, they understand the need for sustainable reforms, that that's, that's a crucial part of security over the long term. But, as you mentioned, I mean, we've got these competing priorities. We need the Gulf states for access. We're focused on capacity building. They're important coalition partners. So what should DOD do differently? And then this question about, you know, how do you operationalize this, um, this recognition or this discourse? I mean, should DOD start leveraging its, you know, what tools does it have to, to maybe nudge reform forward? I think the the US and perhaps especially the, the defense establishment do enjoy significant soft power. I think mm -hmm. that they can send a lot of messages, not just with what they say rhetorically, but with their behavior. And I think, for instance, in the, the case of Bahrain, there has been rhetorical pressure on human rights, but at the same time, the US has embarked on this very large scale expansion of the military base. Mm -hmm. And the UK has announced the opening of a much, much smaller base there. So the behavior is sending quite a clear message that no matter what we say uh, about political reform and human rights and so forth, we are going to intensify the relationship. We're here for the long haul. And therefore, ultimately, these issues that we're raising don't really matter. Uh, so I think at the same time, those Western governments have rather been able to, to kid themselves that they don't have leverage because they say, oh, we say these things, we bring up these issues, but it doesn't, they don't do anything. Uh, but I think it's because they are really sending mixed mm -hmm. messages. Uh, I think also another important element of soft power, which is a bit more long term, but very important, is the... Uh, the, the training, the capacity building, the interactions that take place through military academies and, and universities and so forth. I think there is an opportunity there to try to develop together a different sense of what leadership means, a different sense of what security actually means, um, you know, whether that it's really a sustainable security model to have armed forces where you systematically exclude large portions of your population or whether there's ways to bring people in more inclusively. Um, I think it's also about setting the priorities in terms of Western strategy. How central are the Gulf states to your wider regional strategy? And there is a bit of give and take here as well. I think to have a real partnership with the Gulf countries, we have to acknowledge that for many people in the region, the Islamic State is just one of many problems. It's resonated, uh, you know, it's, it's killed a lot of people in Iraq and Syria, but it's not the only group that's done that. And for many people in the region, they feel that Westerners are obsessed with the deaths of Westerners and with threats to religious minorities, but that our governments are not doing enough on issues like the, the continuing conflict in Syria and the successive Syrian, Iraqi and Palestinian refugee crises. So acknowledging some of those concerns that the Gulf governments and populations have is also really fundamentally important. Great. If they are going to listen to us, we have to listen to all them. Right, all right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, Hanif Kashani, Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. Uh, I know Matar you briefly touched upon uh, Bahrain and subsidy reform in Saudi Arabia, but I wanted to ask the panel, um, and I know that each country has its own distinct set of circumstances, but um, how can the governments of the, these Gulf countries basically um, institute subsidy reform, whether it's cash or fuel, 
in a socially and politically feasible manner, if at all possible. Thanks. Hi, Matt Frankel. Uh, to dovetail on Fred's question that he just asked, uh, this is a great report and reads very well f for um, appealing to folks here, but how do you incentivize Gulf states to act on these, what incentive is there to act on these suggestions when the feeling in these capitals is they've weathered the storm, that um, the moves that they saw in other countries in the region are just destabilizing, and that there are these threats out here, they're not just imagining them, right? There are terrorists and other threats, and this is what's prompting this crackdown. So how do you get the governments in Riyadh and Doha and Manama to, to accept the argument that more openness is a uh, the, is the optimal longer term strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the young woman. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Hi, Kelly Flanagan from IREX. Um, I just wondered if you had any insights on um, whether there are ways that youth are learning advocacy either in school or online that might help facilitate a more democratic environment in the countries and in the government. Thank you. I guess these are all to you. Huh? <laughs> no, these are great questions. I'm going to start with this important question of, you know, what's in it for them? What's in it for the governments in the Gulf? And I think here we need to look at their own interests, their own stated objectives, and their own history. I think it is a very fundamentally important issue that all these countries know that there's a need to restructure the economies, and they do have very real aspirations to have world-class knowledge economies, to have the best universities in the world, not only taking their students over here, but coming to the region. Uh, subsidy reform is just one part of this, of this picture, but it is part of it. Um, but, it's, but, but there are going to be trade-offs, and having a, a knowledge economy, for example, does require having some level of academic freedom and access to scholars and so forth. And it also affects the expectations that your own citizens are going to have, because I think fundamentally that's what it's about. I don't think it is really about outsiders advocating online for democracy in the region. I think that fundamentally those pressures are going to be coming from inside, although people inside will be looking at models of democracy as it's practiced in the West and sometimes seeing it as a model and sometimes not. You know, there's a lot to be said for... We can say what we like about Western democracy, but it's what people see of it and sometimes seeing, you know, violence and human rights abuses and perceptions of Islamophobia in Western countries also undermine the status of those countries as models. Another uh, critical issue, I think, is, yes, the Gulf countries feel they weathered the storm of the Arab Spring. They do have anxieties about transnational movements and about the, the influence of Iran in the region. One of the arguments that we make in the report is that having a more solid and inclusive national system is a critical counterweight to transnational identities. We've seen this before. Kuwait has feared Iraqi expansionism for decades before 1990. One of the reasons for the establishment of their parliament was to have a real national arena for politics. And again, they made a, a deal with the opposition during the Iraqi occupation to say we are a genuine, solid nation state that everybody buys into. Iraq cannot use Arab nationalism as a tool against us. So I think there are lessons from their own histories. I think there are constituents within ruling families who see uh, a, a different future, but right now they are generally speaking on the back foot. Subsidy reforms, anyone want to tackle? Question on subsidies, how, how we do that, yeah. I, th I think it just is part of this bigger picture. I mean, you're seeing some tweaking around the edges. You're seeing, you know, UAE, for instance, making the real cost of water and electricity more transparent to nationals on their electricity bills. There's a lot of awareness raising campaigns. But if you look at a country like Oman, where there's a particular fiscal squeeze at the moment, whenever governments are saying we've got to clamp down on public sector pay and what citizens get, you are now seeing a pushback from citizens on social media saying, let's examine government waste, let's examine corruption. We're not going to be the ones that take all the burden of, of cuts on ourselves. So I think it is part of a, of a bigger picture of making the public finances somewhat more transparent and making some tough choices about what the 
the ruling families themselves can expect to spend. Just, uh, if I just one point on that too, one thing that you see linked to the idea of uh, expatriate or migrant workers too is that because the pressure comes from the citizens not to um, take on these additional costs, the initial costs are pushed over a lot on migrant workers. So that you see in Kuwait a lot of restrictions on sort of uh, access to healthcare, even access to driving and different things like that put on expatriate workers um, and added fees uh, to try to get some of the revenue coming from that side as well. Yeah, I'll just add regarding the, the issue of subsidies. Uh, and inside this report, there is a contribution from uh, Abdullah Abdel Al and uh, Ghassan Shihabi, PhD students who participate in, 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 in this work, uh, who, who tackled this issue where th they were saying that it's very hard to move to a, a really uh, a dramatic changes touching the subsidies or introducing the taxations without having really a powers that are trusted by the people. In other words, uh, without a political participation. Uh, those things should go together. Otherwise, the, the, the people in the Gulf will reject any ideas like this. Becca Wasser, Rand Corporation. Um, you've talked a lot about how these future trends in the Gulf are going to influence the relationships between the Gulf states and the West, but you've talked a little bit less about how these trend lines are going to impact uh, the relationships between the Gulf states themselves. Do you think that these trends are going to exacerbate existing rivalries or create new ones, or do you think that it will actually have um, a bit of a unifying effect for the GCSA? Oh, wait, I didn't say, sorry, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Michael Kurzig, formerly of the Department of Agriculture. I just listened to Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu make a very compelling case about the threat of Iran's nuclear capacity in the Middle East. Talked also about Hezbollah and uh, Hamas, what's going on in Syria, the Houthis in Yemen. Do you in the Gulf uh, uh, countries see that as an existential threat to you uh, are the Gulf countries, of course Saudi Arabia included, going to respond with some type of nuclear energy or uh, nuclear armament? Are we looking at an arms race or a nuclear race in the Middle East? Thank you. Mahfouz uh, Dadros retired. Jane made an excellent point about the need to diversify the Gulf economies to expand the role of the private sector, create jobs, and the rest of it, subsidy issue. Uh, what do you see the effect of the lower oil prices on this? Would the Gulf countries move forward with this, or they will postpone it and take a rainy check for the next round? Thank you. So, um can take it in reverse the or the, you want to go with the internal divisions question first? yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you um, I think if the Gulf countries are going to possibly embark on a renewed period of political development and liberalization then that would necessarily take them off in different directions. I think there's no one-size-fits-all model, and I think there's a tension within the GCC over whether they should try to have very different models or whether they should all converge, which would probably keep them all at a, at a fairly low level when it comes to participation. Uh, you've seen, obviously, the greatest divisions between UAE and Qatar being you know, fundamentally about, about regional policy, but that also reflects their very different assessments of whether the Muslim Brotherhood is domestically a threat. Uh, I, don't, I think now you're seeing the GCC states try to pull together to have more credibility uh, internationally, but I think you still get very different views internally about whether political Islam is something that can be accommodated, as has often happened in the past, um, or whether it's something that can be sort of cut out of the, the picture and deemed to be entirely a threat. You also see quite different views in the Gulf about Iran. 
Uh, it's not an issue where there is any unity. So you've seen on one hand Oman brokering the talks between the US and Iran. For some of the Gulf countries, they, they can be more concerned about Saudi Arabia uh, potentially trying to push them around than about an Iranian nuclear weapon being a direct threat to them. But there is an open discussion, especially in Saudi Arabia, about potentially if there is an Iranian uh, nuclear sort of threshold capability or weapons capability, whether Saudi too should develop a deterrent. One of the problems that they have is they're, they're behind. So this would take quite some years uh, to catch up on. Uh, something else that I would advocate for is that there really needs to be some parallel track to the nuclear negotiations that looks at the, the issues that are fostering a regional conflict between Iran and the Gulf states, especially Saudi Arabia. Uh, that that needs to take in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, a host of very complex issues. But if those issues are seen as being ignored or sidelined by the international community, then even if there is a historic nuclear deal with Iran this summer, you could really see a backlash in the Gulf, in the wider Sunni world. And that's something that groups like Islamic State are already using as a recruiting tactic. Um, I'll take up the question of diversification. Um, I, I think it, it's it's worthwhile to at least acknowledge that there has been a, quite a bit of degree of diversification of the economies of the Gulf states. If you look at the last oil boom, um, it looks quite different from the first oil boom and the way that the money was invested. A lot more of it went inside of the Gulf states. Um, we've seen the Saudis making a big push towards um, diversification into petrochemicals. That They've been quite successful internationally in that. Um, and of course, the examples of Dubai that have been pick it, taken up by Abu Dhabi and also Qatar, which they can use their extreme wealth to kind of push into different um, areas. So, so there has been some of that. Um, the bigger challenge, of course, is, is um, in meeting the demands for jobs, not in those smaller Gulf states, but in states like Saudi Arabia and getting citizens to move from public sector jobs, which are, have much larger benefits, to private sector jobs. Um, I think there's also a question, though, about the, the means of diversification and what you're really diversifying to. Um, I mean, I think a lot of that diversification has gone into sort of large projects and these sorts of things and big name things. I, I know in Kuwait they've been pushing now again for a long time, talking about a new becoming a center for you know international finance, like the Gulf needs another international finance center. Um, and one thing that was uh, interesting in keeping with this theme of integrating new voices is that when Kuwait's um, government took on a project of trying to listen to Kuwait youth and to have them communicate their own priorities through a program they called uh, Kuwait Tisma. In fact, the young people, this is one of the things they were really irate about, and they were like, why are we even talking about another financial center, which is just replicating things that are already there, that's just going to uh, benefit sort of the elite. And this is the big critique of a lot of these big diversification projects is that they go to these state-run companies or to um, elite family, business families that are linked, and that the wealth isn't distributed as broadly. Um, and their solution was to push more and to make Kuwait a center for small and medium enterprises and more in keeping with this idea that young people want to be more involved in the economy and more entrepreneurial industries and this sort of thing. Um, and so I, th I thought that was interesting. And I think Kuwait has responded actually by creating this huge fund for a small and medium enterprise. We'll see if the government can actually manage it. But I think that's another issue is to look not just at diversification, but at the type of diversification and who it's trying to reach um, within society. We've got time for one more question, if we have it. So, okay, so we've actually ended on time. I actually asked my panelists to, our, our panelists to end on an optimistic note, but I'm not sure if we're, <laughs> we're there yet. But I will say they, it, the, cause, the cause for optimism is this excellent report, and hopefully the Gulf will uh, take it into account. So please join me in thanking our, our panelists for an excellent uh, job. Today.